Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Podcast Series, Interviews with the Expert. I'm your host, Sharon Hayes. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist and vice chair of faculty development and academic advancement for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Arash Madi'i, who is assistant professor of medicine and interventional cardiologist here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and his expertise is in endovascular procedures. So today, our topic is chronic limb-threatening ischemia. So chronic limb-threatening ischemia is a common problem associated with high morbidity and mortality. And Dr. Motei will share with us contemporary management strategies for those patients who need aggressive and multidisciplinary evaluation and treatment to reduce the risk of limb loss and also to reduce their associated cardiovascular risk. Welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Glad to be here. So, Russ, what are the key clinical manifestations of chronic limb-threatening uh, ischemia, and why should I, as a general cardiologist, really care? Sure. Uh, chronic limb-threatening ischemia has two primary uh, clinical presentations. The first is a patient who presents with gangrene or ischemic ulceration, typically involving the feet. Now, gangrene is straightforward to diagnose. You see it, and you know what it is. Uh, ischemic ulceration uh, in patients with CLTI typically involves the forefoot. It's anywhere along the toes. It can be seen at the calcaneal level. And a third common site of involvement is the lateral or the medial margin of the forefoot, which is kind of a watershed area between the distributions of the anterior tibial and posterior tibial arteries. Um, but you should also bear in mind that if patients have ulceration from other etiologies, for example, neuropathic ulceration in diabetics, uh, that ulceration may not heal well in the presence of a significant underlying PAD. So you still have to address the PAD in those cases. The second common clinical manifestation is rest pain. Uh, this is a type of patient who comes with a very characteristic history. Uh, they'll say that they have pain in their foot at night. Uh, the pain is worse when they're in a supine position. And many of them learn that if they dangle the foot off the side of the bed or get up and walk around, the pain gets better. Uh, we call this improvement in pain with dependency. Uh, they're relying on gravitation to pull flow into the foot. And when they place that foot in a dependent position, they're helping uh, with the perfusion of the foot. Some of them will, in fact, start sleeping in recliners because uh, that's, that's one way they can get enough sleep without having to wake up multiple times at night because of pain. Um, when we see patients with rest pain, the key differential is neuropathic pain. Uh, you can have a diabetic patient who can have PAD, but can also have uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So it's clinically important to distinguish between the two. And neuropathic pain is also more noticeable to most patients at night. It's not that it's not there during the day, uh, but patients tend to have a higher degree of somatic awareness at night, and they tend to notice it more at night. Uh, but uh, one key clinical feature there is that it does not improve with dependency. So uh, when you take the history, you can distinguish between the two uh, using those characteristics. Really helpful. I mean, we're trying to prevent limb loss and mortality. So what is the risk? Um, uh, I, I'm sure there's people walking around um, who have these symptoms that have not been they may not even bring it up to their internist or their cardiologist if they're seeing one. So uh, why why should we be more aware? Um, what are the risks? Sure. I, I think the key message that I want to deliver is that of all the patients that we see along the atherosclerotic spectrum, uh, be it uh, coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, uh, or, or peripheral arterial disease, uh, patients with chronic limb-threatening ischemia are at the highest risk of adverse outcomes, not just limb-related, uh, but also in terms of their general cardiovascular event rates. There are prior data that show that the amputation-free survival, which means patients survive to about one year with both limbs, is only about 50%. Uh, so of every four patients that we see, two will be alive at the end of the next year with both limbs. 25% uh, of patients will lose a limb, and another 25% will have a fatal cardiovascular event. Uh, there are more contemporary data, uh, for, for example, from the best CLI study, which was a comparison of endovascular and surgical techniques, uh, which was recently concluded. Uh, what they showed was that a median follow-up of 2.7 years, the mortality was about 33 to 38% 
uh, in these patients. And above the knee amputations occurred in about 10 to 15%. So there has been some improvement in the outcomes uh, of these patients with improvement in revascularization techniques and also a general uh, preventative cardiovascular care. But we're still uh, far from where we want to be. We're, we've still got a long way to go. Yeah, well, thanks. So um, the patient comes to our office, maybe they give a, a history that is consistent or we see some signs on physical examination. What are some of the next steps in terms of diagnosing this? Uh, sure. So uh, the classic uh, test that has been done is the ankle brachial index. Uh, one key message that I want to deliver about the ABIs is that it, these are unreliable in patients with chronic limb threatening ischemia. Uh, we know, for example, uh, from the IMPACT DEEP trial, which was a trial that studied uh, a drug eluting balloon versus plain balloon angioplasty in patients with uh, infrapopital disease, that between uh, 28 to 42 percent of patients with chronic limb threatening ischemia and angiographically proven infrapopital disease will have either normal or supernormal ABIs. So the key message is that if the situation clinically looks like CLTI, uh, please do not rule it out if the ABIs look normal. Uh, they can look normal and they can be deceptive uh, in that regard. The second thing with ABIs is that they sometimes come back uh, with a report of non-compressibility on the vessels. Uh, if you see a vessel described as non-compressible, especially if it's a tibial vessel, you should bear in mind that about 50% of the times that vessel is going to have a 100% occlusion. So non-compressibility when reported indicates a high probability of disease and, and needs to be evaluated further. The other test that we frequently do is something called transcutaneous oximetry, where we measure the oxygen tension in the foot at, and in the leg at various levels to determine two things. One is wound healing potential, and the second is amputation level. But the key thing with TCPO2s, again, is that there's a lot of overlap between patients who go on to heal their wounds and patients who do not heal their wounds. So it's really important not to use TCPO2s on their own as a sole determinant of wound healing potential or of a major decision like amputation level. Uh, you have to look at some other clinical data. There are anatomic tests that can also be done, such as duplex ultrasound and CT angiography. Uh, these are excellent tests. You can uh, localize the disease. You can see the extent of the disease. And especially with CT, uh, you get a very detailed map of what's going on, and that helps you with operative planning. You can plan your entire procedure based on what the CT looks like. These are not needed in every single case. I think many operators, uh, when they see a patient with uh, chronic limb-threatening ischemia, will go directly to angiography. And I want to emphasize that angiography is a gold standard, and that any patient who is faced with the possibility of an amputation it deserves to have an angiogram done as soon as possible. Uh, Non-invasive testing can be used to supplement all these things, but uh, it should not delay uh, the definitive procedure, which is angiography and revascularization. Yeah. So, so if I heard you right, nobody, we, we should not depend, particularly for as serious a decision about amputation with a CT angiogram. Uh, the CT angiogram can uh, certainly help you plan and diagnose the issue. Uh, but uh, it can occasionally obviate the need for an angiogram. But in mm -hmm. most cases, I think a key decision like amputation should should only be made after you've done a full angiographic assessment mm -hmm. and you've determined, you know, what you can do from a revascularization standpoint. And then based on that, you can determine yeah. what amputation level to choose. Uh, so I think I, I want to emphasize this because there are many patients in the U.S. who currently will undergo a major amputation procedure without any form of vascular assessment. Uh, and I think I think that uh, that that needs to change. I think these patients definitely deserve an angiogram. That's a gold standard, and that's 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 the one definitive way by which you can assess and treat these patients and take them to revascularization. So, Arashka, I know that is really your practice right now and what you're trying to change. So, give us a, sort of an overview of what you and others might have to offer in terms of revascularization of this limb threatening ischemia. Sure. Um, so revascularization is possible in the vast majority of cases. Uh, I want to emphasize that point. Uh, most commonly these days, we accomplish this with endovascular techniques. Uh, it's uh, also commonly done with surgical revascularization in appropriate cases. But I have to say that over the last, uh, especially decade and a half, there has been remarkable progress uh, that has been made with endovascular techniques. 
And most uh, complex lesions, I would say easily over 80 to 90% of them can be successfully revascularized, even if they're long segment CTOs. Now, there is a subgroup of patients that we refer to as the no option patients. These are patients who have advanced infrapopetial or below the ankle disease. Uh, these are patients who have either failed a conventional endovascular or surgical revascularization, or they simply do not have targets for revascularization. Uh, we, until recently in the last few years, did not have any good uh, strategies for for this type of patient. But uh, and and we also know that they have very poor outcomes. Uh, from recent registry data, we know that such patients have about a 39 to 44 percent six month amputation free survival. However, we have a new procedure called deep venous arterialization. Uh, in this procedure, we convert one of the uh, posterior tibial veins and the lateral plantar vein into a conduit for delivering uh, blood flow into the foot. And uh, we know from the PROMISE trial that studied this that we can expect uh, approximately a 66% amputation-free survival uh, for patients when treated with this technique. And that's a substantial improvement uh, with what we had historically observed. So I think the key point is that for most patients, uh, revascularization can be done and it is successful in salvaging limbs, especially when it's done in a timely fashion. It sounds like you've got your work cut out for you over the next few years with these new techniques. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> and raising awareness about, I think what um, for many of us who who trained um, before these techniques were available, um, kind of with a mindset very much of we're heading toward limb loss. And I think what you've described for us is um, a lot of hope for um, with these new techniques of both providing survival, but also um, event-free and amputation-free survival. That's correct. I, I think a lot can be accomplished with current techniques. Uh, we are far ahead of where we were, you know, even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, for most patients, uh, things can be done. But the key thing is that uh, the treatment has to be done in a timely fashion. Uh, there is now an increasing recognition that there is a time to treatment effect for these cases. Uh, so uh, the key message that I want to deliver is that if you see somebody uh, with a situation that looks like CLTI, uh, please make sure that they see one of us uh, who specialize in this as quickly as possible. And then our goal is to try to expedite their evaluation and revascularization as much as possible. Uh, usually, you know, if there, if there are substantial delays for certain types of wounds, for example, a calcaneal wound, uh, mm -hmm. you, you have a very little window of time uh, before that ulceration gets to the heel bone and then the limb is not salvageable. So yeah. I think time is of the essence. It's, it's really important to make sure that uh, everything is done quickly uh, so that these limbs can be saved. And I suppose there is still a role for people like me doing preventive cardiology to make sure they're on statins and they quit smoking and all of those other important things going forward. Absolutely. As I, as I mentioned, one of the key problems that we face in these patients is the high, extraordinarily high burden of uh, cardiovascular events, uh, you know, MIs, strokes, or death from cardiovascular causes. So I think the treatment of these patients does not end in the cath lab. Uh, the treatment goes well beyond the cath lab. And what you do outside the cath lab is, is equally, and I would argue even more important uh, for their long-term health. So it's, it's really critical to focus on the cardiovascular risk factors, uh, making sure that their lipids are controlled, making sure that they're on, on appropriate antiplatelet therapy, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, working on smoking cessation. All of these things are critically important. Uh, we tend to get a little bit distracted and we focus mostly on the procedural aspect of things, but it's really critical to bear in mind that a lot of the mortality that we see is not specifically from the limb, it's from other things. And the only way to impact that is by, by, by very aggressive cardiovascular risk reduction strategies. And there's a lot of hope on that end too, obviously with the tools, right? Yep. Yep. Thank you so much for um, bringing this important issue to the forefront for us, because I think um, it may help people, particularly those who don't see this a lot, to think it's not how we did it 10 years ago. It's how it's the path forward. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Uh, and many thanks for the opportunity. So this wraps up this week's episode of Interviews with the Experts. I'd like to thank uh, Arash for joining me today and discussing this important topic. And we look forward to you joining us again next week for another Interview with the Experts.
Be well.